and I'm going to be talking indeed about redevelopment, but I think in the spirit of the comments that we just heard from Shannon and many of the other speakers, uh, we're really talking about sustainable regional redevelopment. What I'm talking about in terms of redevelopment is there are many parts of the planet that have already been developed, but then have fallen into, let's say, social, economic, and or environmental disarray, and they need redevelopment. I realize that there's the sustainable development goals, which are trying to bring, bring development to people across the planet who have not had the benefits of development. But we're also talking about large, a large part of the earth that needs to be redeveloped in a sustainable way. So I'd like to uh, focus on that. And uh, one of the other things that I would like to insert into uh, my thinking and your thinking, hopefully, is that this is really built on infrastructure, okay, infrastructures. And I think we need to begin to look at interactive infrastructures and there are three major kinds. There's the gray or traditionally engineered infrastructure. There's the green infrastructure based on ecosystems and nature. And then there's, uh, as I will explain, the human infrastructure. Uh, that is very much in the spirit of craft and what it's all about. Um, and, and one of the, the things that strikes me about craft, it strikes me about Kuseg, is that it's really trying to convey a sense of place. And I think that much of our environmental uh, uh, problems in, say, emerging catastrophes is the fact that we don't have a good sense of place. And um, in that spirit, a region has a context. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about regional, sustainable uh, regional redevelopment in the context of global change, because we are part of a planet that's moving in a particular direction. And what could be the contributions of regional redevelopment towards uh, mitigating and also adapting to the global change that we see all around us and well beyond this region. Um, I've spoken informally to several people in this group about the acceleration of all sorts of social and or environmental uh, variables. This um, uh, panorama of change is what we've seen over, uh, I guess, a 250 year period. Uh, that's really less important than seeing that everything is going up exponentially. Whether you're talking about population, whether you're talking about a growth in energy use, whether you're, you're talking about fertilizer consumption, whether you're talking about water use, whether you're uh, talking about the rise of telecommunication and international travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, along with those, those social domain uh, issues and act, human activities, uh, are the responses of the Earth system. Carbon dioxide is going up very quickly. Uh, methane, uh, ocean, the oceans are becoming acidified. Um, we are seeing now a peak in the marine fish catch because we've overfished the, the oceans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and this is all, uh, this essentially is a linked um, a chimera of, 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 of variables that we need to understand is the context in which we're trying to design our way into the future. Okay, um, now, uh, this has been thought about for quite some time. I, I think uh, we heard yesterday, uh, someone showed the limits to growth, was that you, Chandra? Showed the limits to growth uh, in one of the slides. Uh, and there are, are um, thinkers who have been sort of continuing in that spirit. And there's now a thought that's emerging that we cannot on a sustainable basis, continue with these exponential trends. Something's gonna to have to happen. And this curve here shows a peak on which we're probably getting towards the top of that peak. And then there's going to be a transition and then potentially a contraction. And the question is how do we engineer our way into a soft landing rather than a, a, a crash? And there's a guy that um, has been very influential to me, I, I guess I'm, I'm his academic grandson, and his name is Howard Odom, and he basically invented um, the world of uh, ecosystem services and uh, ecological energetics, and from that spawned the <clears throat> subdiscipline of e ecological economics. And, and he's been thinking, of, he, he had been thinking about this, he's passed away now, but he had been thinking about this, this is his last book, and he's thinking, well, okay, where do we go from here? And uh, I think these are very, very important questions. Um, 
Now, along that trajectory going up, and despite the fact that there's been a general buoying up of the economy and, and human well-being, there have been catastrophes, uh, often at the regional scale. This is the, these are kind of byproducts of unsuccessful development that have left some behind. Maybe the great majority has gone forward. But certain regions, like the rust belts of the United States, maybe the rust belts of, of Europe, if you want to call it that, uh, have been left behind even when the, the general trend has been towards an expansion of economic development. So the question becomes one of spatiality. How are the regions uh, more or less vulnerable to these changes? And then, to my mind, the bigger question still is what happens when we hit the peak and we come down, when everyone will be scrambling for a position in the, uh, in the development agenda, or imperative, if you want to call it that. Um, Okay, here's a picture of Howard Odom, uh, and uh, very influential in, in my thinking and the thinking of lots of people, I should say. And um, he, he uh, had a set of principles that he laid down back in 1973. And um, he's talking, I circled uh, principle 11 and principle 12. I, I will read it to you because it's really central to my thinking here. Um, and in, in, uh, when he talks about how energy, ecology, and economics are fused together, and he was the real first, first thinker about this, he said that even in urban areas, and you could say regional areas, uh, more than half of the useful work on which our society is based comes from the natural flows of sun, wind, water, waves, etc., that act through the broad areas of seas and landscapes without monetary payment. Okay? An economy to e compete and survive must maximize its use of these energies, not destroying their enormous free subsidies to us as humans. The necessity of environmental inputs is often not realized until they are displaced. That was principle number 11, principle 12, so a corollary of that is that environmental technology, and we've heard about that last, last couple of days, environmental technology which duplicates the work available from the ecological sector is an economic handicap. Now, I was ins inspired. Perhaps this is a brave thing I'm going to do here. That guy there was me when I was reading this. Now, it took a while to get the beard. And um, young, uh, young men in the audience, if you're trying to grow a beard, like, uh, Ferry, just give it another 20 or so years. It'll come in nice and thick, OK? Just give it some time. <laughs> OK. But anyway, it was extremely uh, inspiring to me to read this. And at the time I read this, this was a very abstract idea. Now, in the last, I guess, half century, literally, um, I and my colleagues writ large, I've developed toolkits to analyze what this is all about. And I'd like to reveal some of what we've been thinking about, because he, this guy, Odom, really captured the essence of the question. OK. Before getting into some of the results, I, I did want to mention the uh, sustainable development goals, which otherwise would be a complicated affair of interconnections along the lines of the last talk. Indeed, all the SDGs, all 17, are extremely interconnected with each other. However, there's an organization to the way, in some sense, the planet will develop. And um, there's a hierarchy in my, in my mind, there's, and this is not my diagram, but there's a hierarchy that I could certainly agree with that's captured by this particular diagram. And that is that if you want to grow a successful economy and you want to grow, if you will, or develop an equitable society, you've got to have a biosphere that's functioning. This is along the lines of what Odom says, but this is also an organizational principle of the SDG. So if you treat the Earth system kindly, you will be rewarded in a very much Odom sense of the word, Howard Odom sense of the word, with an equitable society and uh, well-being for people and, uh, and their uh, growing and sustainable economy. Okay, this is, um, there's lots of theory that goes behind this, no time to, to discuss this, but if you accept that as the, the framing, I think we can, we can proceed. Okay, so I talked about these three infrastructures in the first couple of slides. So there's, um, there's nature-based infrastructure, we call that the green infrastructure. Green infrastructure up top, top corner there, uh, can be well managed and can be um, uh, appropriately used by humans to convey services. These are called ecosystem services. And right here I'm looking at 
the infrastructure for water storage, dam dams and reservoirs. And, and there's lots of literature to show that if you are, are a good steward of the environment and upstream systems and you are careful about how you manage your downstream water releases so that you don't uh, destroy important species, as we've heard about, uh, unfortunately, in China, uh, you could have a very nice interaction between the gray infrastructure, the, the engineered infrastructure, and the green infrastructure. And the flip side of that is shown at the bottom. Poorly managed landscapes yield to very stressed and damaged gray infrastructure. Okay? And there are interactions here. And right in the middle, the, the, the real fence that one jumps over here has to do with the human infrastructure, the decision-making architectures, how people make good or bad decisions, determine whether you're at the top of this diagram or at the bottom of the diagram. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist uh, to, to understand that the top part of this diagram is where you want to be if you're talking about sustainability. If you're in the bottom half of this uh, mapping, that's not a good place to be. And it, in fact, the system is almost, by definition, non-sustainable. OK, okay now uh, let me. Uh, Reveal to you a newly published paper, and there's some copies of the papers that, that Linda was very kind enough to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make for us. Uh, there are only a few, so no, not that one, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain later. But anyway, this is the first reveal of, of a paper that we've, ju we've just published here. And what I would like to, to do is I'd just like to show how human interaction at the global scale um, determines water security, okay? And so there are three diagrams here. The first diagram on the top left is a mapping of the source area for water supply to humankind. And it's actually mapped out in terms of the populations that depend on the water source areas before they flow down to those people. And in, a, in an absolute sense, before humans interact with that water, it's of high quality and it's abundant, okay? So that's why you've got a lot of blue coloration there, okay? Uh, and uh, that water provisioning before humans intervene is good, clean water. Then, because of the intimate connection of humans who are not such great water managers, and we often pollute water supplies, we often overuse the water, uh, we destroy biodiversity, etc. it becomes impaired. So that when we observe what's out there in the real world, we start to see reds and yellows. And reds and yellows here are not blue. And it's meant to show impairment. And the darker the red color, the more impairment, the more damage there is to these otherwise abundant, clean blue water supply. Okay, So intuitively, wherever you see red and yellow, that's where you have most um, impairment, most damage to, to the water systems. And then what we do. Uh, and what we do where we can afford to do it is we rehabilitate, we repair the damage to try to resuscitate the water supplies that we deliver to humans. So this is the traditional engineering, the water treatment, the drinking water treatment, the uh, wastewater treatment facilities that try to rehabilitate the damages that we caused from the bottom right. Okay, and that costs us $700 billion a year globally, $0.7 trillion per year. Okay, that's the way we analyzed the problem about 10 years ago. In the intervening 10 years, we inserted the concept of ecosystem services. And when you think about it for a while, we see as an observed damage to the system what's on the bottom right. But in reality, there are ecosystems in the Howard Odom sense of the word that are giving us free subsidies that we've never really recognized or put a monetary value on. And so this is the first analysis globally of the value, if you will, the worth of ecosystems, which if you didn't have them, if you destroyed the ecosystems, what you observe would be way worse. It would be extremely impaired. But the ecosystems are quietly in the background, without much recognition, fixing some of the problem for us. OK. And we put a monetary value on that. And lo and behold, and I worked with several economists on this, and as best we can tell, there's about twice as much value 
of preserving the ecosystem, because if you didn't have that ecosystem, you would do what Odom said. says. You've got to rehabilitate it using technology, and guess what? It would cost you twice as much as what you're spending to rehabilitate on now. So this is that free public service function, now known as ecosystem services, that Howard Odom spoke about, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the SDGs and how these are interconnected and they uh, produce short circuits. Okay. This is uh, the economic trajectory, and these are millions of people on the vertical axis, uh, and this is annual per capita uh, 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 distribution of, of uh, across uh, per capita wealth, the uh, populations that we see, okay? And uh, there are three trajectories, one for a year 2000, 2030, and 2050. And what you see is this movement of the blue curve transformed into the green curve, transformed into the red curve. This is the absolute fabulous success of SDG 1 in terms of poverty alleviation. No one is going to argue that this is a good thing, except myself, because this is great for SDG 1. Strictly speaking, human well-being in economic terms. But it may spell disaster for water systems unless we do things differently. And our business as usual scenario where we screw up the system, we break the system, and we repair it, right, is going to uh, cause us all sorts of problems as we see this development. It's, a, it's essentially a, what I showed you, that scheme in the last graphic, is a simple consequence of economic development with very little thinking about environmental sustainability. And we have lots of evidence that that's happening. So if we do what we've done in the past, this is going to spell real disaster. And what we've done is we've actually, these graphics on the bottom here, on the bottom right, show the trajectory of threats to the water system. This is a uh, level of threat in, as a map. Black means uh, extreme threat, red less so, uh, green uh, and, and blue uh, less, less uh, pressure on the system. Okay? And we see the trends of the past continuing into the future with quite dire consequences. Okay? Now, uh, one thing that we see with business as usual, we do nothing different than we have in the past, and that's why we have to really think about redevelopment because the past is going to get us into trouble. The map on the top right is a proportional increase in our dependence, our deployment of traditional engineering. And there's a whole sector of the economy, we said $700 billion a year uh, in, in that sector. So there's lots of reason for that sector to promote more engineering. And in fact, business as usual would show that we're going to deploy more and more and more uh, traditional engineering. And the, the darker the blue means the more rapid rise in the deployment of traditional engineering, that the sector is, is, uh, is champion, championing. And I don't blame them for that. They're trying to make money, right? So, so in, in many parts of the developing world that, that don't today have traditional engineering, that sector is going in and advocating for investing in traditional infrastructure. That's all. That's well and good. But at the same time, we see on the bottom the green infrastructure, so the ecosystem services that we're talking about, and the condition of the natural capital, the condition of nature, is not blue and uh, green. It's brown in many cases and yellow, which means that it's being destroyed. So in the next. Uh, uh, 50 years, or not, well, from now it's uh, less than 30 years, uh, we are going to see a dramatic expansion of engineering and a dramatic expansion of environmental degradation. And if you believe what, what Odom talks about, we're losing that free public subsidy. That's, a, that's free to us. And we got such a benefit from it in the, in the past. What's going to happen when we begin to destroy that natural capital? And so we put numbers on this, and, and you know, we, we could say that uh, in the period from 2000 to 2050, we have more than doubling of traditional engineering, and we also have an increase in the value of green infrastructure, which in some sense is counterintuitive, but it shouldn't be, because as we lose natural capital, it becomes ever more valuable to preserve. And by our best guesstimates, it's going to still be larger in terms of its value to society, the green infrastructure, than will uh, the traditional engineering. But the whole idea is to recognize the value and not destroy it. Okay, 
So let me shift gears a little bit um, and really get into the re redevelopment idea, the regional redevelopment idea. So if we're talking about climate readiness, uh, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, um, the recent assessments, and I, I guess you could start with the IPCC, but you could also uh, point to the uh, U.S. Uh, National Climate Assessment. Um, they're looking at the regionalization or the regional realization of climate stressors, okay? So, yes, there's a global problem. It's a, you know, the world is to some degree mixed, but it's not mixed perfectly, and there are going to be winners and losers, and it's these regional stress points where there could be many, many people dependent on a stable climate that won't see a stable climate. Okay, so that's where the, the, the real problem arises. Um, and so we really need to be thinking about the regionalization of the impact and how regions can interact coherently and productively to try to um, uh, work, uh, work this existential challenge out. Okay, and this is actually from, from uh, our friend Odom again, where he's talking about, you know, how, how we're going to come off that, uh, that uh, uh, expansion curve, come back down, and, and hopefully uh, with, a, with a very um, smooth landing. And uh, one of the things that he looked at is the, and, and it's a reflection of the reality, the, the earth will be an urban earth, it will be a city-dominated earth, okay? And uh, he was talking about designing cities of the future. You know, and, and very much, I think very much in the way of craft and in, in some sense, you know, talking about how these hubs are interacting and you leave green space and you have transportation and communication that brings things together. And, um, and I, you know, I, I think great minds must be working alike, Ferenc. I think this is very much craft thinking in my, in my view. Okay, um, well, we tried to put this into action a couple of years ago. We, um, Hillary Brown, who's a professor at my university, and I, and Shandor, who's sitting in the front row here, we uh, hosted a group of, uh, I guess, 15 or so students. They were distributed between Hungary and the United States. And we uh, attempted to design a, uh, at least a provisional blueprint for a circular economy, a regional redevelopment effort for the Kuseg region and, and Western Hungary. I'll just show you a couple of uh, a couple of images here, and, and as I mentioned, there, there are a precious few. I think there are four or five reports that we published here. So whoever wants one, talk to Linda, and maybe they're, it, online. they're online as well. But you could have a physical copy if you want. But anyway, so we came up with this scheme, which is probably not anything novel, but it was applied in the the Kuseg's, um, uh, Kuseg context. And it talks about ecosystem services. Uh, it talked about the city and, and uh, regional complex in which it, 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 it sits. And then we uh, anticipated the uh, arrival and growth of uh, centers for e eco-innovation. And the whole idea is to take raw materials from the environment, process them through this e eco-innovation uh, center, if you will. This piece of infrastructure, I guess, we could call it that generating nutrients that then get placed back into the environment uh, and uh, producing goods that flow into the uh, urban complex and uh, produces waste, which is reprocessed. Uh, the whole idea is to uh, reduce the um, openness of the system, circularize it, minimize the dependence on imports, perhaps uh, uh, you know, create value-added exports that don't deplete the system. And if you notice what's around the, this, this whole scheme of arrows, uh, it's education, workforce development, and outreach, uh, community policy, government, and investments. These are all human dimension issues. I, I'm an engineer, I'm an uh, earth scientist as well. I appreciate more and more the fact that you've got to have that, that outside component that's, that's kind of hugging the whole thing. When without that, None of this can even be foreseen. Okay, so this is just you know, one of a few examples of what we were talking about. I think maybe, Shanda, you might have shown the same thing. We're talking about green infrastructure here at, a, at almost a micro scale. Uh, so we're talking about rooftop solar systems and biodigesters, infiltration, uh, fields within the uh, you know, domain of a small piece of infrastructure. Uh, I like to think more broadly, so the kinds of global uh, assessments that I, I unveiled uh, are operating at a spectacularly larger, have to, at a spectacularly larger pl 
planning scale than something like this. It's at the minimum the full regional scale, if not multi-regions, if not continents, if not global, to reverse the trends we are talking about with respect to water security. But you have to start somewhere, and you have to engage the public, and this is a fabulous way, we think, think to do this. Um, this is a very complicated diagram, and I just wanted to uh, pass on a couple of messages on uh, to, uh, to our redevelopment thinkers here. Um, I have a na U.S. National Science Foundation project that's a group project that involves several organizations. It involves about 20 or so uh, researchers, from senior researchers down to students. We have a modeling scheme where we work with stakeholders, we work with Earth system scientists, we work with climate modelers. We have simulation models that produce a set of, of t uh, outputs, um, model, we model variables that allow us to test hypotheses. Uh, we try to understand how a regional system, in our case, the Midwestern U.S. and the Northeastern U.S., how it behaves as a functioning unit. And then we work with stakeholders to find out what their particular concerns are. And we try to uh, engineer, if you will, the questions that we answer with our models to the needs of the stakeholders. Okay, so stakeholder engagement is very much part of a co-design process, which is essential. Uh, I think the essential ingredients for our study, and I would argue for any redevelopment craft type thinking, are, are analytics, okay? And so we have geospatial analysis, we have systems dynamic modeling, and that's particularly important to look at alternative trajectories. Uh, we, I highlighted here, because it's important, socioeconomic context. You cannot even think about this stuff without understanding what the backdrop is socially, politically, culturally, culturally as well. Uh, and then uh, engage the stakeholders, okay? And uh, uh, I think that this as a pillar of craft thinking is probably important because otherwise it could get abstract. And I think the idea is to make it very concrete and ask specific questions and get, in many cases, numerical answers. And that's okay because you can express numerical, uh, numerical uh, outputs from models to, to a user community very easily, especially when you put it in dollar terms. That's what we've discovered. Uh, just two, two, three more slides. Okay. So um, let me just um, uh, talk about an affiliated issue, and that's uh, preparing the next generation workforce. Okay. And uh, this diagram here uh, it shows a very quick evolution of the thinking about water systems in the Earth, uh, Earth system modeling uh, or Earth system analysis community over the last 15 to 20 years. We used to just look at water. But we realized uh, around the turn of the century that you not only have to think of the physics of water and the distribution of water uh, by itself, you have to think of its chemistry, you have to think of its role in the Earth system and bi supporting biology, and you also have to have the human components of this. So we were thinking about this for the last 15, 20 years. And the engineering community, and I complained a little bit about this in one of my interventions that you know, engineers from around the planet uh, are very stovepiped and very uh, myopic often in, in the pre preparing the next generation students. I love using this little di diagram, which is a Swiss army knife, which may have been the way to look at management of the environment in the 20th century. But in the 21st century, the Swiss army knife becomes this crazy, this crazy unwieldy affair. But it's nonetheless what we need to do because of the thorny wicked problems that we are encountering. And I'm not the only one thinking about this. There's a move, at least in the US educational system, to try to broaden the perspective of engineers. I think I'm 100% behind that, and it's absolutely essential to get the humanities back into the engineering domain. Um, for those of you who work with me, you know I'm very much uh, a champion of uh, events and very concrete things, OK? So I'm going to present a th uh, thing for you in a minute. Last traditional slide is going to be the argument that we cannot do this by ourselves. It's no one institute, it's no one uh, principal investigator. It's a, it's a group, it's a family effort, if you will. And it, we all have to um, join hands here to solve these thorny problems. And 
It's not unidimensional. It's that Swiss Army knife with many, many different blades. OK, so uh, last night, it's my last slide is, is right now. Uh, last slide is, uh, came about, uh, this is after, I have to admit, it was after a couple of glasses of wine, and discussion with several people in, in this room, uh, and a nice dinner that we have, a post-dinner that we had with Ferry and Akos and, and Marianne. And um, we came up with an idea as, as an event that we think would have great public relations value. Yeah? OK, so our idea is to have a Pannonian nudgy competition, OK? And um, I think Ferry said the good old engines of sustainability. And um, this should be an event I think could be built around the uh, cultural, the, 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 the cultural uh, year of, uh, of Vesper and Boloton. And uh, let's look at what we could do. What could we do? Well, first of all, there'd be categories of entry. So you bring your, your nudgy to the, to the event. And you enter. Who nudgy is. Oh, nudgy, sorry. Grandmother. 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 Was a grandmother. I hope that translated. <laughs> they said it did, OK. So this is a, gra this is a grandmother uh, competition, OK? And so what could, what could we possibly enter them into? So first of all, you know, there'd be a class of event. It could be called the gentle scolding event. Who's the best gentle scolder? Babysitting, who's the best babysitter, right? My favorite, who, who, who bakes and, and, uh, and there's a, you have even a uh, egg toyash breaking ceremony, yeah, if we, if we want. If, that, yeah. Well, we have polichinta and we have gombots and that, that'd be a separate contest. Um, we'd have um, hot foods as well. Don't forget they cook hot foods as well. We could have a... Um, uh, handicraft race, who can sew the fastest uh, Kezi Munka, and um, oral history, don't forget the oral history, and last but not least, which I think is relevant, grand prize, the craft regional redevelopment essay, so there we go. So anyway, if you adopt this, we, will, we would like to, we'd like to work with you on this, so that's my last slide, so there we go. All right. Okay. Thanks so much, Charlie. What? Whoops, one last slide. Could you just put the last slide on? So Linda has some copies of these documents. Uh, there's also a web. Maybe we could get the uh, presentation onto the website, if, if that'd be good. And there's, there's, a set of, there's a set of links where you could get the background material on this. It's, oh, and one of the things I didn't mention that we uh, had a paper that came out uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, water conflict in Europe that was uh, published in the Hungarian Hydrologic Journal just recently that I didn't even talk about, but it's relevant, I think, to the, to the thinking at large here. So um, feel free to contact us to get that information. So, okay, thank you. Thanks so much.